Welcome everyone. Today is World AIDS Day, December 1. And I'm here today at the Soda County Alumni Chapter of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. And we will be talking about HIV AIDS in our communities. So I'm a clinician and what I do every day, my job description and what I do is to take care of people living with HIV. So uh, my HIV family, they are like my own family. So let me just give you guys a quick uh, statistic so we can start from there. About 40 million people worldwide are living with HIV. And then in the America, here in the US, you have almost 2 million people living with HIV. And what stands out the most is that most of these is actually here in the South. So um, it's kind of, I don't know, kind of worrisome, you know, when, when you think about that. And uh, I'm from Memphis, I uh, live in Memphis, and recently uh, Memphis ranked number two in the entire country with the newest cases of HIV amongst our teenagers. I'm talking about the ages of 15 to 22 years old. And so for most people that are here that have kids, I'm gonna assume that we have children in that age range, including myself. So my kids are all within that age range. So, I mean, it's, it's shocking and it's something that as a parent, you're like, okay, what are we doing wrong? right and just so you guys know more than 80 percent of these new cases are amongst the black population so what what is it what are we doing something something's not right somewhere as a clinician who takes care of these patients daily you can imagine how i feel watching my patients die and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. So that's gonna bring me, you know, basically, let's talk about, you know, the symptoms, you know, okay. The question is, how does this happen? Now, um, she had mentioned about knowing your status. So from clinical practice, what I saw was that most of these people, most of the patients, first of all, came into the hospital for other things. So they did not even know they have HIV. And so nine out of the 10 patients every, I take care of every single day with HIV, that's exactly what the presentation is. They had no idea. Why? HIV is mostly asymptomatic. What does that mean? As Tina has said, it's something, how does HIV kill? HIV doesn't come out and kill you. It kills by destroying your immune system, right? Your immune system is that part of your body that helps you fight infections, right? And you know, you, you know that you know they'll be like, oh, somebody has weak immune system, so they're always getting you know COVID or flu or whatever it is. And that's exactly how HIV works. It would destroy your immune system, and so even the tiniest infection, the tiniest thing, would kill you. And so for the average person that's walking around the street, you have no idea that you even have HIV, right? And so they come up in the hospital because, oh, I'm having chest pain or I'm having pneumonia or I have a headache, you know, one thing or the other. And then we check your HIV is positive. Now, for there are three stages of HIV. You have the acute phase, which is, you know, what happens around the time within the first two to four weeks when you contract the, the infection, you might have something like a flu-like illness. Mm, I was sick for a few days and then it goes away and then you're fine. And then you have this period that's called a chronic phase that will last like 10 years where you have nothing. Like there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. So unless you have a crystal ball, there's no way to know you have the infection. So that's where knowing your status is, is very, very important. The time, by that time, you know, people are presenting to us in the hospital, majority now have AIDS, which is the end part of HIV. That's the point where when you get to and nothing is done, you will die, it's guaranteed. And so those are the patients um, in this class are the patients that I do take care of. So how do you contract HIV? There's so many ways. Um, each and every one of us here can contract HIV. The commonest would be through sexual um, relationships. So where there's exchange of bodily fluids, um, it could be vaginal, it could be seminal, you know, different ways of, you know, exchange through various types of 
sexual practices, vaginal, anal, and you know, other kind of sexual practices. Then there are other ways that you can contract HIV through blood transfusion, but now that we scrape blood so vigorously, um, the chances of you contracting HIV through blood transfusion is very, very low. So then you have what we call the fetal maternal transmission, and I've seen this so many times that it breaks my heart. And this is when a pregnant woman who does not go for antenatal care doesn't realize she's HIV positive and then comes, shows up in labor, has, you know, gives birth to a baby and the baby's HIV positive, right? And we see that so many, if you come to Lebanon, we have a HIV clinic for, um, HIV clinic for the kids. And these are kids that were born to HIV positive mom because they did not know they had HIV and they were able to pass this infection um, on, you know, towards their kids. Another way would be sharing of needles. So it could be not necessarily IV drugs, you know, people that are using illicit drugs. It could be maybe a diabetic, right? That, you know, your insulin shots, you're sharing needles with people. Um, you can contract HIV because you don't know what your other person has. So this would be the commonest methods that people get HIV. So me standing here as a black woman, majority of the patients I take care of are also black women. And what kills me, it, like I say, is not knowing your status. When you're involved with somebody, when you have you know, an intimate relationship with somebody, and you do not know their HIV status. And you know, and so a lot of times, you know, women, you know, you know, you you've been going steady with somebody, you know, so you're hoping, you know, they're faithful, you're faithful. At this point, I feel like you just need to take care of yourself. So make sure you get tested. Before we leave here, we have the testing, free testing, know your status. Like I said, majority of the cases that show up in the hospital are people that didn't even know they had the infection. So it's very, very important that you know your status, male, female, whatever it is, and that way you know what to do. So let's now assume that you're HIV positive. Okay, you get over the shock, what do I do? That's why you have physicians and healthcare providers like myself, like Dr. Tina, that's what we do for a living, to take care of that. As she said, HIV is now a chronic illness. It's no longer like it was in the 80s, like you know, you talked about your uncle, where it was, it was literally a death sentence. Now, you take one pill a day, and you are fine. So the issue that I see in clinical practice is what we call non-compliance, which is where people just refuse to take their medicine. And there is no way out, you will die. It's just a matter of time. And so for me, sitting down there and watching my patients die, a useless death because you were not taking your medicine. So if you don't take any message away from me today, one, know your status. Two, if you know if you're HIV positive or you have a friend, a family member that's HIV, we need them to take your medicine. As long as you're taking your medicine, you become undetectable like Dr. Tina talked about. What does that mean? It means that the medicine is able to keep that virus so low that when we check for it, it's gonna be absent. Mind you, there is no cure, it's a virus. So it's gonna be in the body forever, but you can control it. Why, why is it so important to be undetectable? You will not be able to pass it on to somebody else. Even if you're HIV positive and you have sexual intercourse with somebody else, you would not pass that infection over to, you know, to the next person. So this is something I kind of wanted to stress on because my patients that have died, that is what's killing them, not being controlled. So now let's talk about, let's say, you know, let's, you know, give a typical scenario, you know, something happened, you know, you had some, you know, um, you know, close intimate relationship with somebody and you did not know their HIV status, what should you do? 
So that's where I'm sure everybody here must have heard about PrEP, which is the post-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. Let's talk about PrEP. What is PrEP? The pre-exposure prophylaxis. These are medicines. We now have medications that are available to every single one of us here. And so if you find yourself in a high-risk sexual situation, Either you know maybe you're with somebody that has multiple partners, or you have multiple partners, <laughs> or you do not know the status, the HIV status of your partner. You can get on prep. There's something that is called discordant couples, which I do have a lot of patients like that, where you have husband and wife. One person is positive, the other one is negative. So what do we do with the one that is negative? We put that person on medications to prevent them from getting this infection, you know, they can go up, you know, live their normal life. So it's called PrEP, pre-exposure. So we're giving you this medication to kind of prevent you from getting HIV. So you also see this in commercial sex workers. Uh, we can see that in um, men who have sex with men, that, you know, that's where you have the highest um, patient population. Um, you know, that we can put you on this medication. What it does is just to prevent you from getting HIV. Now, what happens if for some reason you've been exposed, right? Um, Dr. Tina talked about when she had a needle, you know, stick. For those of us in healthcare, we still have to take blood, draw blood, you know, on, on our patients who are HIV positive, whether they are controlled or uncontrolled, or you had, you know, one fake party and something, you know, one thing led to another, you know, you had, an in, you had some relationship with somebody that you don't know their status. You can get on PEP. PEP stands for post exposure prophylaxis. I need you guys to know, please share this information, okay? When, if you're able, if you find yourself in one of these scenarios, you know, be it needle stick injury, be it, you know, um, in, you know, intercourse with somebody you don't know their status, or perhaps it's HIV positive, you don't know if they're controlled or not, you can go to the nearest emergency room, you can go to your, you know, PCP's office, you can go to any acute care facility and say, hey, I think I've been exposed or, you know, I, you know something happened, I'm not sure. We would put you on medication to make sure you do not get that infection. It needs to happen within 72 hours. Okay, usually the first 24 hours is the best time to get that medication, but if that didn't happen, you have 72 hours to take that medicine. And what it does is to prevent you from getting HIV. So let's assume you ended up, you know, having some kind of intercourse with somebody who's HIV positive, and we put you on PEP, the chances of you catching HIV is slim to none. Okay, so but most people do not know that we have this things available. So for nothing else, I want everyone here today to be very um, com comfortable talking about PrEP, the pre-exposure prophylaxis, which are the medications we put you on to prevent you from getting the infection, and then the PEP, which is the post-exposure prophylaxis, which is the medications we put you on post exposure to make sure you don't convert from HIV negative to HIV positive. The first thing we will always do would be again to check your status. We need to make sure that you are HIV negative. If you're HIV positive, we can give you either the PrEP or the PEP. We actually have to put you on the full dose of HIV medicine. So um, thank you all for giving me this opportunity to talk about this. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about, given the fact that this is what I do for a living, and um, it, it more than 80-85% of new cases are amongst the uh, black communities, and then um, it's also affecting our children 15 to you know 23 years old, that's we're talking about high school to college age kids, it's devastating. And so for every parent that is here, it's so uncomfortable, but I need you all to have these conversations with your kids, um, you know, because they don't know. 
um, I have a 15 year old and every time I try to talk to her, she's like, oh, please, oh my God, like they do not want to kid, like call it, kid, like kill me, like they have this will just shoot me, like they, they don't want to talk about it, I'm like, well, we're going to talk about it because uh, obviously something is wrong somewhere. So I'm going to encourage every single parent here, when you leave here, you have teenagers, you have kids in college, you know, in your early 20s, sit down have this conversation about safe sex practices, let them feel free to come to you, ask questions. Um, if you guys need any one of us, we are always available. There's so many you know, of us around that um, we are more than happy to help in any way. Sometimes and I've had parents say, hey, can, I bring your, can, can we bring your kids so you can talk to them? And I sit down and talk to them. And most times they listen, but the whole idea is for them to, you know, know that these things are here. My kids, prior to me talking to them, have absolutely no clue what HIV is. My son is, is a senior in college, and I'm like, what do you mean you don't know about HIV? Like, are you serious? And um, I was speaking in one of the schools, and I was asking, I asked this, you know, um, a group of girls, and I say, hey, what happens if you are exposed to HIV? And they said, oh, we just take antibiotics. I literally almost had a heart attack. Like, absolutely not, okay? Like, at that point, like, I went from shock to panic mode because it became clear to me that our kids are completely ignorant. And nobody, it's our responsibilities as our parents to talk to them about this. Is, hey, this is actually exists. My son is in college. I'm not going to follow him around every single day. Hey, what are you doing? Who are you talking to? But we have to pass along that knowledge. So when we're saying that it's something percent of the new cases are amongst these young kids, amongst the black kids, these are our children. Yeah. So there's something we're doing wrong. So my own message today is to encourage every single one of us here, especially the parents, have this conversation with your kids, have this conversation with your grandkids, have this conversation with people around you. That way, hopefully, we'll be able to get that right down. Thank you.